Uh, welcome back, everybody, or to those who are um, here for the first time. Welcome now. Uh, this is the last of a series of three lectures, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and today, Wednesday, on, you know, which I call Learn Quantum Cryptography. And it's my attempt to sort of comp take the essence out of a quantum boot camp course that I've taught twice during this year and focus on uh, mastering an element of quantum technology without going through in, in without the the rigor that would ordinarily be required of a research project. So if it works, you'll have some memory of things you heard in this course, and maybe they'll provide a mnemonic for you to um, to look carefully into something if if the topic comes up in a more interesting context. And like my ideal is that you you know you're going to get a call from a a quantum information startup be called in for a technical interview and they'll ask you, okay, we'll explain a quantum proto, you know, you think you you say you're so enthusiastic, you know, you got a background in IT, that's pretty cool, but you know, just explain to me an interesting quantum protocol and do a technical analysis. And uh, I think with the material here, you could go quite far in that direction. And let me let me give you a sort of an example. So here's the here's the cover slide I showed at the beginning um, the, in the first uh, introduction to the series. Now I've uh, it, the the uh, the heads above the bar from left to right are Charles Bennett, Gilles Brassard, who were the invent inventors of uh, the first quantum cryptography protocol. Then Arthur Eckert, personal friend of mine who's uh, responsible for one of the great innovations built on top of that, or actually parallel to that, an entanglement-based cryptography. And finally, David Merman, who is a, um, uh, together with Bennett Broussard, developed yet another different type of entanglement-based quantum cryptography. And the, um, the scene is, is it's a figure from, well, well, let's blow it up. This is a figure from the paper Nature, published on June 25th, uh, the most spectacular practical implementation of uh, quantum cryptography yet developed, or yet demonstrated. It's uh, a, tr a, a distribution of quantum key from a satellite, orbiting satellite, not shown to scale to two Earth stations in China, and the ground distance between those Earth stations is over a thousand kilometers. And now the, there's two insets to this figure, A and B, and you see these are these are circuit diagrams. The, the, the part B is the circuit diagram associated with the, the satellite, the, the instrumentation on the satellite, and then uh, uh, inset C on the left is the uh, optical circuitry associated with these ground stations, which are, have a, a telescope that can image the light set from the satellite. And they've got all these abbreviations here. Okay, dig it. For those of you who were present at yesterday's lecture, the final, the final subject in that lecture was a discussion of a quantum random number generator. And what's it based on? It's a, a truly beautiful thing. It's based on a so-called polarizing beam splitter, which, by the way, is based on this other amazing device, amazingly simple, passive device, made out of glass, drawing no current, drawing no power, completely passive component, which takes quantum particles in, and then sorts them out in different direct puts them in different directions depending on their polarization i mean this is like a a transducer of internal quantum state information into mechanical motion 
I can't tell you how beautiful that is. In fact, I was thinking as I was putting this talk together, you know, I can't stop thinking about this Wallaston prison and the quantum random number generator. There's something so beautiful about that. And I realized I've taken several major changes in technical direction during my scientific career. And the ones that were successful, like going into a new field, were all based on my finding some fascinating device and getting so interested in how that device worked. And when I had a modicum of that sort of knowledge, I could sort of map it on, you know, the use of that device into problems in the field I was thinking about. And that way I could attract, you know, the cases I've been successful is because I've I've gotten skilled collaborators who supported me wonderfully. But it's because I think after those skilled collaborators that I focused on, you know, focused on a device. So, you know, if you wanna, you know, if you wanna do anything to follow on the, the, to this course, I would suggest you go look at the um, the original paper associated with this quantum random number generator, because it's so easy to understand, and it demonstrates an important quantum functionality. That is, it takes a stream of light from a conventional light emitting diode that can it's tuned electrically and from it it generates it, it can be used to generate uh, a random uh, stream of bits zero and one and you know I'm not just making that up you see this the PBS notation in the in the quantum random ge number generator image well look at this over to the left, there's a couple of PBSs, and up on the up on the right. So the, the polarizing beam splitter is actually the, the core transduction element used in this quantum cryptography program, based on satellite to ground communication. Okay, so there's, <coughs> pardon me, three main themes in this talk. First one is the measurement problem, which sort of builds on the conclusion of yesterday's talk, but I'll, I'll recapitulate that as we start. Then something very important, uh, it's the key, uh, key precept of quantum information called the no cloning theorem. This is a theorem, I don't, and I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's not a hypothesis. It's a key consequence of the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. And what it says is that it's impossible to make a copy of an unknown quantum state. Now, what does that mean? So, you know, all these, every, every communication protocol is based on you know, some consistency and stability of the things that are being used to communicate. So it's certainly possible to produce an indefinite number of quantum states that are all the same to within manufacturing tolerance. For example, it's, it's easy enough to produce a stream of identical photons that are all polarized in the vertical direction. You just build a factory and it starts spitting them out. What the no cloning theorem says is there is no machine that can take a, as input a quantum state and produce as output a copy, an exact copy of that quantum state. I see some hands up. Are there any... Uh, any comments that people want to make? I'm not actually reading the chat. Thing. Yeah, that's me, Charles. I'm putting uh, some of the papers that you've referred to. Oh, okay. Up there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Actually, down in the, the lower left-hand corner, there are two links. The first one is to course materials in the Quantum Boot Camp course. Oh. And um, some of those are world-readable. And I put that there because there are copies of these of these. Um, 
uh, the, pap the fundamental papers that I mentioned uh, that can be obtained there that oh, might yeah. not be easy otherwise. And then the jqi.umd.edu URL, that's just the Joint Quantum Institute, which is, you know, my primary affiliation. Got it. Okay, so, uh, and then we'll conclude with a technical analysis of the uh, quantum key distribution protocol that was laid out in 1984 by uh, Charles Bennett and Gilles Broussard, for which they received the most recently awarded Wolf Prize in Physics, Wolf Prize in Physics of 2019. Okay, the measurement problem. So here's something that I used as an example in the previous talk. Uh, it was a filmed demonstration, and it took advantage of the fact that uh, in many conventional flat panel displays, probably very likely uh, the one that you're viewing this presentation on, the light that's produced by the display is polarized. How many of you knew about that beforehand? Terrell, were you, were you aware that most flat panel displays, the light that comes off of them is, is highly polarized? I'd like to say yes, but it, given a, an exam question, I'm not sure exactly how I would have answered that when, I, when measured. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not a big secret. I happened to discover it myself sort of by accident because I was, you know, I, I have this fascination with devices. Well, the optical polarizer is the bomb, you know. So once again, passive, but so important. I think it's just like fiddling around the polarizer in front of my laptop one day. I noticed that the screen, was, the screen gave off polarization. Then I learned that that was a standard, a standard manufacturing process. And it, there's also some flat panel displays that aren't polarized. So let's, let's use this as a platform for a measurement question. How would you, I'm asking, now I'm asking members of the audience to respond. How would you check the light coming off a flat panel display to see whether it's polarized? And let's say, make it a little bit more precise to determine the direction of the polarization. Let me, let me remind you, right, from the previous talk, uh, light is a wave, it's a transverse wave, so it's electric field os oscillating in the plane that's perpendicular to the direction of the propagation. And polarization, if it's polarized, it means that those oscillations have this, a fixed direction in space. And so the polarizer, the way the polarizer works is much like the way we th think of how a, um, a, a, a wave on a string would go through a picket fence. If the oscillation of the wave is, is parallel to the slats, then it can go through. If it's perpendicular, then it's blocked and if it's at an intermediate angle, then you do this geometric construction, the composition of resolution of forces, and you find that a fraction, a fraction of it goes through. But let's, uh, so let's, you know, what would you do with a flat panel display in order to determine whether the light was polarized? And if so, the, the direction of polarization. Well, if it, to answer that question, if I had a friend who had forgotten to return uh, 3D glasses, <laughs> I would ask him or her to borrow their 3D glasses or set of 3D glasses, two or three of them. And I think you're kind of giving me a hint here as well. Uh, I think I would, I would use that as a polarizing filter and see what comes out. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm not going to replay that video, but here we see two of those 3D glasses held in a fixed orientation. And you can see the one, the lower one on the left. One of the lenses is opaque, right? One of the lenses is dark, whereas the 
the lower, the other lens below it is virtually transparent. So that's telling us that the light, the polarization of the light that's incident on the dark part of the lens, that the light is perpendicular to the direction in which that lens is polarized. Or, and if we were doing it live, we could say, okay, look, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna describe the polarization using the glasses as a reference. And so you could just rotate the glasses around. I think this is done to some degree in the film. You rotate the glasses around looking at the screen through one lens. And what you'll see is that as the, as the, the direction of the, uh, the blocking axis of the polarizer approaches the direction of the polarization, polarization of light, you get an eclipse. The lens turns dark. As you rotate it around, you know, it goes from light to dark to light again in 180 degrees. And then that, so even if you had a partially polar, if you didn't know the polarization, you could use a set of measurements rotating the polarizer to determine an estimate of the direction of polarization. And if, as there often is, there was only partial polarization. In other words, some of the light was unpolarized, but a component of it was polarized. You could use that technique to estimate the fraction of the light that was polarized. And so here, yeah, I just say, observe the dependence of transmitted intensity upon the orientation of the pass block axis. So in other words, measuring the polarization of an unknown source of light is a quite a simple procedure provided that you have a polarizer. Actually, I'm gonna use the words polarizer and analyzer. They mean the same device, but polarizer, they mean, they refer to the same type of phenomenon, but the pol polarizer means, you know, you, 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 maybe you, you, Put the you put that 3D eyeglass over the face of a flashlight so that the light from the flashlight comes out polarized. And analyzer means you use that, you use the three the the three D eyeglasses to measure the polarizability. And remember what happens according to experiment when we look at a, a light wave with a polarizer, uh, when, we, when we send the, the light of whatever type through the polarizer, uh, sorry, at the picket fence towards the analyzer, uh, what we see on the other side of the picket fence is always polarized in the direction of the analyzer. In other words, here the analyzer serves as the polarizer. And what happens is that, you know, you always get the same polarization of signal on the other side of the analyzer, but the intensity of the signal uh, is reduced, is re the strongest intensity is when the polarization of the light is parallel to the analyzer and then if it's not parallel, but it has a projection onto the uh, pass axis of the analyzer, then you see a fraction of the intensity, which is uh, goes as a cosine squared of the angle between the polarization of your light and the pass axis of the analyzer. We went through this <laughs> tedious detail. Now, what's the measurement problem? Well, uh, as we, you know, the subject of yesterday's lecture was, what does quantum mechanics imply about optics? So 
one of the key principles is that uh, quantum mechanics, you know, according to Einstein's original vision, the energy, the energy in a light ray is bound up in packets of a fixed small energy, photon energy, equal to this elementary quantum of energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of light. And so when we have a single photon that's incident on an analyzer, we can't have this fractional division that we use in classical optics. And the reason why this never, you know, this never became um, apparent to people who were doing ex experiments in optics <coughs> until rel relatively recently is that the, the elementary energy of a single photon is very, very small. And so it's, you know, it's only recently that we've been able to, to develop single photon sources and detectors. So quantum mechanics sort of puts forward a conundrum. How do we, you know, we must, we must see quantum mechanics has to make predictions that agree with the classical world in the domain where the, the, the size of the quantum is very, very small compared to the other characteristic scales of the problem. I mean, otherwise quantum mechanics would portray a, a completely different macroscopic world than we know now. And so the resolution of this issue, uh, and by the way, it's you know, also experimentally determined, uh, but intellectually, uh, people like myself are satisfactory with, our, with saying, well, what happens is we get when we send a photon, send a yellow photon towards the picket fence, sometimes it's blocked and sometimes it's changed into a green photon on the other side. And, you know, when we say sometimes, we say, well, with a probability of cosine squared theta, it becomes a green photon on the other side of the fence and with a probability of one minus cosine squared theta, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't get through. And that's in fact what is observed in experiment, and, but it, it reflects the, the basic uh, measurement procedure of quantum mechanics, which was called projective. In other words, you project a quantum state, the state of the object onto the state of the measuring apparatus and take the absolute square of that. And that's the probability that the measurement yields the result that the apparatus is, 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 has been calibrated. So, so if I could just think out loud for a second then. So the photon is tr transmitted with the probability of cosine squared. Right. And so that's a probability. So uh, let's see. So, so I say something about the cosine. The, the cosine, the, the cosine is um, the cosine of the angle. If, if you look at that triangle, green, red, yellow, the cosine angle theta is just the ratio of the length of the green arrow to the length of the yellow arrow. And the yellow arrow has this variable direction, right? That, that's, you know, the person that's shining the light can control. So when, when the yellow arrow is parallel to the green, then cosine theta is equal to one. Equal to one, yeah. When, when, it's, when the yellow arrow is, is equal to the red arrow, then the cosine is zero. So uh, just in case people, you know, not everybody is thinking about trigonometric functions all the time. Yeah, imagine. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, that's what they say. I've never met an example in my life, but I'm, I'm, I've discovered on my own how important it is for quantum computing because that's 
uh, that language that we use. But where I'm going with this then is, um, you know, it's it's a it's a quantum compute device then. Uh, I mean. Yeah. This you know we're it's what the randomness. You don't know. That that that's correct. So uh, and and this is why you can't you can't measure the unknown polarization of a single photon because when you do the measurement you're either getting a photon or not or not and so if you have now let's say you know let's say you have like a a, a, a laser light source that produces absolutely identical photons one after another then you can cert and you and you you know you know within some standard fidelity that all those photons are polarized in a certain direction, say in the horizontal direction. Well, then you can you can use an analyzer to verify that or, or to test that and put bounds on how well they're polarized. But if you just have one chance, uh, you're not going to make it. And you know we make money out of quantum information by working with small odds, right? Like one photon. That's where the, um, in fact, this indeterminacy, as this is the whole point of this, these lectures, this indeterminacy in measurement, as we'll see, you know, very close to the conclusion of this lecture, turns into a compelling advantage compared to classical measurement techniques. Anything more on that subject? I think this is this is this is actually. I'll put it to you this way. Bennett and Broussard, who invented the quantum key distribution protocol, at one point in their intellectual development, they knew no more about the quantum mechanics of photons than you do now if you've if you've understood about half of this discussion. In fact, at some point in their intellectual development, they probably knew less. So they took, they took, and I don't I'm not, these are like these two exceptionally, exceptionally brilliant people, okay? But they took this knowledge and from it devised a technique for communication that is, let's just say, if quantum cryptography is not modern, nothing is modern. Okay, now on to the no cloning theorem. And this is an important part of the security analysis of the quantum key distribution program. Let's go straight to the horse's mouth. There's this amazing genius, upper left-hand corner, Stephen Wiesner. He was the he was the son of Jerome Wiesner, or Wiesner, I guess you would pronounce it in American English. Jerome Wiesner was the was President John F. Kennedy's. Uh, he was a presidential science advisor, John F. Kennedy, and a big mover and shaker. He's a president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His son, Stephen, was a genius, but, you know, not so career or practically minded. I think he lives, by reports, he lives now in the Negev Desert in Israel, uh, working on um, some kind of a sustainability issues. But in the sometime in the 1970s, he wrote a paper, which he never bothered to publish, with this, this simple title, "Conjugate Coding." And here's what here's what he says. This is like sort of the abstract. This paper treats the class of codes made possible by restrictions on measurement related to the uncertainty principle. Two concrete examples and some general results are given. You can find the text of this paper in the directory of uh, quantum bootcamp course. You have to look for it, but this would be a clue. 
You might even find it on the internet by just searching on this. It is an extraordinary paper, and I will say that, in my opinion, it's very clearly written. It's written simply and clearly. Now, of course, what seems simple and clear to Stephen Wiesner might not be simple and clear to everybody else, but I think it's, it's uh, I'd say it's beautifully written, and it gives, it is by, I think every knowledgeable person agrees that this is truly a foundational uh, paper in the development of quantum technology as we describe it today. And certainly, Bennett and Broussard acknowledge that in, in their paper. They trace the, or, the origin of their idea to this example two in the middle frame here, cited by Stephen Wiesner. Money that it is physically impossible to counterfeit. You know, you wonder why this paper was rejected by journals. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like a crackpot idea. You know, saying, oh, here's something that's impossible to counterfeit. It's like, hey, you see that bridge over there? I'll sell it to you for 10 bucks. It almost sounds crazy. I mean, how could something It seems like patent nonsense. In fact, you know, at the end of this lecture, you might understand enough from the BB-84 protocol, which is basically just a development of this, this crazy, actually, Bennett calls it making unbreakable subway tokens, uh, 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 no, making unforgeable subway tokens. Is there anyone in the audience who even knows what a subway token is? I take the answer to that as no. But it, it's <laughs> the the whole the whole uh, the idea of quantum money, which seems like it's crazy, in fact it turns out to be um, crazy like a fox. Well Peter Shore was just gave a talk uh, gosh maybe a month and a half ago on that. Uh -huh. A very public talk. Yes, and I so heard a version of that talk. I, I you know, in, <laughs> in, in my newness to this ecosystem, that just reeks of a stamp of credibility of the notion. You know, there yeah. had been people... I, you know, I, I don't know Peter Shore well, personally, you know, deeply, but I've, you know, I've interacted with him on a number of occasions. And I'm certain that when he read the first time he saw this Wiesner paper, I'll bet you his reaction was much like mine or like that of Charlie Bennett saying, wow, you know, what, what an amazing, or say, what's it called? Molten in parvo from such a small thing can so much come. Anyway, so here's, uh, yeah, quantum, I, 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 why am I talking up Stephen Wiesner to make him the big star? Um, certainly, uh, the one thing that he emphasizes is this issue the no, on the no-cloning theory, that if you could make a copy of an unknown state, you would violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is a core precept of quantum mechanics. So, okay, you know, maybe it turns out that you can make a copy of an unknown quantum state. I'm not saying that you can't, but if you can, it means that quantum mechanics is deeply and fundamentally flawed in a way that has resisted discovery heretofore. And this is put, is described quite simply by Wiesner. Could there be, I'm reading the lower left thing, could there be some way of duplicating the money without learning the sequence N sub i? N sub i is like 
well, it, it's a it's a quantum particle associated with serial number. No, because if one copy can be made so that there are two pieces of the money, then many copies can be made by making copies of copies. This is like, like some Greek philosopher, you know, how much he derives from these simple ideas. Now, given an unlimited supply of systems in the same state, that state can be determined. Thus, the sequence, the sequence of serial numbers could be recovered, but this is impossible. Huh. Open and shut case for quantum money. Suck on that, Bitcoin. <laughs> be nice now. Be nice. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay. So I think that that takes us to where we need to uh, discuss the quantum key distribution protocol of uh, BB84. And I emphasize again that this is, um, in fact, uh, I don't know if anyone here has heard Charlie Bennett give a talk. Has anyone been to a lecture by Charles Bennett? Personally, I missed it, but there is a, he, he did give a talk uh, uh, at one of the IBM Friday or Wednesday sessions Correct. on yeah. YouTube. I, 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 I see it. Okay. I, I, did, I did see such a talk recently. I'd say within the past uh, couple of weeks. I think it was being given, it would be given as part of this, IBM had this quiz kit summer school. And I think this, oh, the talk maybe. that I saw was, uh, which you can find on YouTube, was taught by Bennett. He's a brilliant man. That's right. And, it it um, was during summer school. Yep. Not just brilliant, but like sort of folksy and and self-deprecating. He's a very appealing person. Um, in my opinion. In my opinion, this paper, the first paper on quantum cryptography, uh, co-authored with Jules Brassard is also very clearly written. And you can find the complete text in the directory that I give here. And uh, I would say that if you have any, if I don't manage to kill off your entire interest in this subject by the conclusion of my lecture, which is just in a few slides, then, you know, if, that, if there's any residual enthusiasm left, It'll be greatly refreshed by reading the clear declarative language of the BB84 paper. And there's also a, there's a, there's a counterpart to our analysis slide that they present there. It's, it's actually the first such analysis. And you can go through, and I'll, sh I'll show that as we move on. You can go through that and, um, follow uh, their analysis, which I've done. I mean, this literally, this is a case in which I think reading the original paper is far more rewarding than reading many of the interpretations that have followed upon it. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let's just st start with, you know, something early in the abstract. When elementary quantum systems, such as polarized photons, are used to transmit digital information the uncertainty principle gives rise to novel cryptographic phenomena unachievable with traditional transmission media. Extraordinary statement. For example, a communications channel on which it is impossible in principle to eavesdrop without a high probability of disturbing the transmission in such a way as to be detected. So this is another, you might say, manifestation of the you might say it's like a manifestation of the uncertainty principle. By the act of measurement, you fundamentally perturb the system in a way that exposes your intrusion to detection. And uh, let's see, does he use the word conjugate here? Well, it's used in the paper. So going back to the title of Wiesner's paper, conjugate coding, what does that mean? And the, the, it's a use of conjugate bases to 
for describing quantum states. And in the BB-84 uh, protocol, it's the use of two different bases to describe the polarization of light. Yeah. Two different bases to describe the polarization of light. <clears throat> Let's say, you know, we're talking about a real world interpretation. You have your quantum cryptography apparatus sitting on a bench somewhere. And so we'll, <clears throat> and the bench is nice and level, you know, because it's a professional environment. So we'll call the horizontal direction is the direction of the, is the, lies in the plane of the laboratory bench. And the vertical direction is uh, parallel to the Earth's gravitational uh, acceleration. I mean, it's the same um, horizontal and vertical that you'd get if you used a uh, one of these rulers with a liquid dial indicator, a, a level, carpenter's level, as conventionally defined. Those are horizontal and vertical. And then the other basis uh, that they use, and this is this is again become a, a matter of convention, is called the diagonal anti-diagonal, where the diagonal direction is uh, halfway between horizontal and vertical, that is at 45 degrees from the horizontal axis. And the anti-diagonal is the direction perpendicular to that that preserves the relative orientation. So in other words, you can get the AD basis. Basis means a set of two orthogonal vectors. You can get the AD basis by rotating the HV basis by 40 degrees with the um, with 45 degrees being determined by the right hand rule. That is, if you put your right hand on uh, uh, 45 on the H vector with the thumb pointed towards your eye, and you rotate your right hand in the natural way, keeping the thumb in its orientation. That carries the H into the V and the V into minus H if you go around by 90 degrees. And if you go by 45 degrees, that takes HV to get to AD. This is the, frankly, this is all there is to it. Yeah, so now, what a coincidence. Actually, I wasn't, when I had this, you can see this, this image of the film that was shown, two-minute film that was shown in the last lecture, as you can see from the Cassius film that was filmed five years ago. At the time, I was just trying to do a quickie to do a polarization demonstration. Little did I know that the 3D spectacles the two 3D spectacles that are shown here define the AD basis. You see? Well, it's, you know, there's a change in the anti-diagonal from the diagonal, but if we reflect it, we get the same thing. So at least, you know, the, in the upper hand, the upper, both the, the orientation of both these, these spectacles are consistent with the polarization of the light of the um, the polarization of the light of the display is when the axis of our its direction is the same as the pass axis of our 3D spectacles when they're oriented for the the right eye of our 3D spectacles when they're when it's oriented at uh, with respect to so that's just to say there's nothing really mysterious about these two bases at all they're just related to each other by rotation okay so now um here is I, you know on one page a courtesy of, of a figure that I obtained uh, 
got got from a manuscript by John Wei Pan, who's the principal investigator of the Chinese satellite experiment. This is uh, this is a description of how the BB-84 protocol works. So, underlying it is, there are two parts of this. One is a sequence of events where Alice transmits, Alice over here on the, the left, let's say there's some time windows so Alice and Bob agree ahead of there. And by the way, that you know, there's the communication between Alice and Bob is gonna is all going to be in the public domain. Okay, so there has to be an agreement before be, between them beforehand that they're going to do this. But they could they could they could correspond. They could make do all their plans on Twitter in the open and never meet each other, and this process can be carried out. The, the one, one thing that's common to all cryptographic protocols is there has, has to be some authentication, mutual authentication of the two parties. So in other words, um, we have to assume that at least there's some shared secret between Alice and Bob, which can be used on their first encounter, let's call it their first Zoom conference. It's like, you know, let's say it, this is just like the world that we're living in now. Everybody's on fucking Zoom all the time. We don't meet in person, but we, you know, we share lots of information and we feel free to, you know, share confidential information with people that we know, that we recognize. And we have a, you know, we're confident that they, that, you know, that our longtime friends when we encounter them on Zoom are not being impersonated by professional actors hired to play them. So there has to be a, there has to be an authentication procedure so that Alice and Bob have confidence. Alice has confidence that the person she's communicating with Bob, and that confidence is mutually shared by Bob. So. Like any cryptographic protocol, it can be broken by an intruder who takes control of one of the parties and uses that party to give them directly the information. But other than this, this requirement of having some original shared secret that provides the authentication step, then the rest of the protocol can be agreed upon in every detail, in open communication that can be read by the e, an, an, an eavesdropper called Eve, who uh, appears down below Alice and Bob here. Eve is an interloper uh, with the, the most uh, capable powers, the most power that's, that any eavesdropper can have. Eve, Eve has the ability to monitor um, to monitor communications with the minimally invasive effect known to physics. So in the you know wiretapping, there's like this FISA court that authorizes the federal government to intercept your communications and uh, you know it's a court because it's relatively easy for the for the state entity to intercept the telecommunications of anyone residing within its borders or even beyond them. And so Eve has all those powers, or stipulated to have all those powers. So Alice and Bob can carry out their entire transaction with Eve monitoring every element of it. So there's no secrets kept from anyone in the design and implementation of the transaction. So the first thing that Alice and Bob do, they choose two conjugate bases for polarizing and analyzing light. 
Alice is transmitting photons to Bob in this protocol. So Alice chooses two polarization bases, and they are indicated, let's see, in the lower left-hand corner, you see there are two, uh, there's a, a four squares. The lower one, the lower row of two, shows the, on the left, the horizontal, and on the right, the vertical polarization. The upper two, uh, which are orange in the figure, show the anti-diagonal on the left and the diagonal on the right. So these are the four different states of polarization of light that are going to be produced by Alice and are going to be analyzed by Bob. You see, Bob has uh, two detectors. Uh, one is uh, uh, two analyzers. One is an analyzer that's parallel to the, uh, that, that is the same as the HV basis of polarization used by Alice, and the other is the same as the analyzer has the same AD axis as the axis used by Alice. And <coughs> so what Alice is going to send to Bob is a signal that represents logical bits. In other words, she's going to send Bob a random string of zeros and ones. Bob's going to record their values. And what Alice does is she, she has a, ran, a quantum random number generator, let's say, like we discussed in this lecture and the previous lecture, and which, you know, I recommend to your further attention. Beautiful device. And did I say, so simple. Or let's say, there's nothing simpler than that that is more beautiful than so Alice will take these a random sequence of zeros and ones, and let's say, let's say she starts, she gets a zero. Oh no. She starts, she gets a one. Well, she makes a choice then. She has a, she has, a, she and Bob have the same logical bit association with the polarization basis. So a one is represented in the uh, diagonal anti-diagonal basis as a diagonal and it's represented in the HV basis as a vertical. That's the this row of the right hand row of the four square, right hand column of the four squares associated with Alice. You see the anti-diagonal has a label one for logical bit one, so does the vertical. And then the logical bit, uh, logical bit zero is assigned to the anti-diagonal polarization or the horizontal polarization. So in other words, when Al Alice, her quantum random number generator um, delivers a bit value, either zero or one. And then she makes a random decision on which polarization basis to use, either HV or, or AD. That could be that could be you could have two quantum random number generators, one to choose the logical bit, another to choose the polarization basis. Or you could use the same quantum random number generator and just use, you know, look for the first, the first bit delivered by the QNRG, QRNG, and the second bit and use, use those to encode the logical bit and the polarization base. I hope I'm not rambling, but I just want to make everything as clear as possible. Now, so that's, I mean, that's, oops, that's part two here. Send single photons to Bob. She makes a random choice of basis and of logical bit for each photon. What does Bob do? 
Bob makes a random choice of his analysis basis for each photon. And then, so in other words, Bob sets, he chooses either the HV or the AD, either the, the purple or the orange polarization basis. And he records whether or not he detected a photon. And he keeps that information to himself. And then Alice and Bob, uh, Alice continues to send, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a finite number of, there's a finite number of, of these transactions that are concluded, agreed upon ahead of time. In this case, I guess it's, six, eight, 10, 12. So after the, and that number could be anything. Uh, in this case, it's after, after the 12th, that's, the, that's, a, that's like a, a, the agreed upon length of string for which the, the final, the final, the, well, it's really the penultimate uh, transaction between Alice and Bob takes place. So, so far, what they've been doing is, is one way, uh, Alice active, Bob passive, sending single photons uh, be, from Alice to Bob. Then, uh, at the end of the sequence, they have a conversation on the public channel. They can do it on Twitter, world readable. What does their public conversation consist of? Alice says, here's what Alice would say. Alice would say, okay, to send the first photon, and now let, let's look at the, let's, let's look at this, there are these two rows above the, the two rows, the lower one says bit sequence, the upper one says detection. So, Alice is, Alice is the, um, the party associated with a bit sequence, right? So uh, Al Alice would say in this conversation, okay, for the first photon, I used the AD basis. For the second photon, I used the HV. For the third, I used HV. For the fourth, I used AD. See, I'm going along this row called bit sequence and just looking at the color. I don't, I don't say anything about the direction. I just look at the color. Uh, first one is AD, second HV, third HV, fourth AD, fifth HV. And you see, I'm not specifying in my communication to Bob whether when I, you know, if I used AD, did I use the A or the D? I just say which of the bases I used. So that's only, that's, that communication by Alice does not send any information. It sends information to Bob, but it contains no information about the logical bit value of the photon that Alice transmitted to and then Bob tells Alice, he reads off from this, this top row that says raw key. So um, Bob would say, okay, um, for the first photon, I used the AD basis for detection. For the second, I used the HV. For the third, I used AD. For the fourth, I used HV. For the fifth, I used HV. It's with just orange, or you know, you could just say, you could just go by color. Alice would say, orange, purple, purple, orange, purple, orange, orange, purple, orange, orange, purple, purple. Bob would say, okay, my turn. Orange, purple, orange, purple, purple, orange, purple, orange, purple, orange, orange, purple. 
So in from from neither Alice's communication, someone listening on the public channel can learn nothing from Alice's communication about the logic, the logical values that she sent, and they can't learn anything from Bob's public information about the um, logical values of the bits that he received. So then the final, when they get done with that conversation, <coughs> excuse me, then Bob, Bob and Alice can each independently reconcile their information. And what they do is they throw away every example, every communication in which they didn't choose the same basis. This is the conjugate, this is the conjugate uh, basis coming into play. So for example, let's look at the two rows, the upper one says raw key. Unfortunately, there's, there's a little bit of registration problem with this thing, the four and five. Just look at the raw key in the bit sequence rows. So the first transaction, both the polarization and analysis uh, squares are orange. That's retained. The set, it, actually, this is like kind of doing, uh, what do you call it? The, um, uh, is that the exclusive, I guess it's the exclusive nor. It's, it's the identity operation. When, when, when the two bases are the same, you retain the, uh, the information and otherwise you eliminate it. So the first transaction is all, all orange. The second transaction is all purple. The third transaction is mixed, it's thrown away. The fourth transi transaction is mixed, it's thrown away. The fifth, purple, purple, kept. The sixth, orange, orange, kept. The seventh, purple, orange, rejected, and so on. And so then up here, and they both, Bob and Alice, know from, the, from their public conversation, they know which bits to retain and which to throw away. And that that gives them their private key, the ones that were retained. And they've never exchanged information about the logical value of the, the logical value of the photon that they detected. But they know what it is because, for example, Alice knows Alice sent a um, a diagonally polarized um, photon in the first sequence, and she knows that Bob used a the AD basis for detection. So what does that mean? That means now we're assuming you know we're ignoring things like imperfections in detector and analyzer here. But that, that's a second step in the security analysis, which we're not going to take today. But just in the in the you know in the ignoring those these these elements of noise, that means that if Bob used the A D basis for analysis, there's two possible settings. Bob either set it to the diagonal in which case he would have detected a photon with certainty, or to the anti-diagonal, in which case he would have detected no photon with certainty. So that means when the two bases are the same, Bob knows from his detectors exactly the polarization be, uh, of the photon that Alice sent because it's matched to the analysis of Bob's detectors. Now when Alice, let's, let's, take, let's take the third transaction. Alice sends a horizontally polarized photon and Bob uses 
an AD uh, detector. Well, if Bob detects a photon, if a, a, a horizontally polarized photon coming onto a diagonal analyzer, there's a 50% chance that it's detected or not. And it's the same for the anti-diagonal. Anti so the detection of a photon under those circumstances tells you absolutely nothing about the the photon that um, uh, Alice actually sent. You see, in this case, the conjugacy in these the conjugacy of the bases means that there are results which are certain when the bases are aligned and which become ambivalent when they're not aligned. So the ambivalent and uh, I think I've sort of if I like filled up all the time I think so now does anyone oh I haven't talked about eavesdropping Terrell were you going to ask me what about the eavesdropping no but I I'll, I'll take a cue. Um, yeah, why, why, why don't you? Why don't you give you? Why don't you give me your interpretation? So let's say Eve, Eve, Eve has all the information that Bob and Alice have about the design and implementation of the system. So she knows what their polarization bases are, knows the direction, and she has. You know, she's a well-funded secret agent. She has. Uh, she can monitor their public communications. She has a, you know, she has access to the path in space or in the optical fiber through which these photons are traveling, and so she can carry out polarization measurements of the photons as well. Then what I would do, I would send some false messages to uh, Alice and play with Eve because I know Eve is listening okay Alice is not receiving messages she's oh. only she's only transmitting okay okay there's a, well, there's, well, a there's a public communication but wait. that happens after all the transactions of single photons so I, I would know that Eve is listening because Eve is is measuring the protons and Alice and I, if I'm Bob, we will just be out of alignment. We'll know that. Okay. If that's where you're taking me. Um, right. uh, uh, yes. Okay. That's true. But what you're describing, what you've just described, I would call a denial of service attack. Okay. Because, yeah, that's because, right. Eve could do because, that. Yeah. So Eve, Eve has the ability to, it, let's just say, there is no... Yo, know, only God has the power to hold off a denial of service attack. Okay, within within any competition, right. there's always an option of a not denial of service. The whole idea here is that, you know, the parties don't want to make World War Three. They want to steal some money and get rich. So Eve wants to take advantage of the information that's being exchanged between Alice and Bob. And it's most valuable if they don't know right. that that information has been taken. This is like, like stealing credit card numbers. Okay, gotcha. you don't want to. You steal the credit card number, the hopes of being able to use it, not to, not to destroy a person's credit card. Yeah, we don't care about that. Yeah, we don't care about DOS attacks. Well, we do, but it, it's kind of like, uh, the way of forestalling goes as a matter of physical security or something like that. Mm. So, so Eve. Let me put it to you this way. Eve can intercept. She knows exactly the wavelengths of the lasers that Alice is using. She knows the exact characteristics of her single photon source. She knows the exact settings of Alice's polarizer, of Alice's polarization basis. And so Eve can detect a photon that's sent by Alice and then send along Send the, send the photon on to Bob. Yeah, I think and you said in the beginning, I think it was you, you know, there's no authentication 
going on here, right? So I don't know if the proton's coming from Eve, if I'm Bob, I don't know if it's coming from Eve or Alice, right? Correct. They're indistinguishable. Correct. So Correct. that to me is a hole in BB-84, not that it would, you know, for somebody else to solve. Okay, uh, but you, know, you see, it's not, it actually is not a hole. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put in writing why that's not a hole here, but it oh. certainly, it can be explained very simply. And let's, let's go back to... Let's, let's go back. We cannot measure the unknown polarization of a single photon. So Eve has the capability of detecting. Eve, Eve can set an analyzer and either detect a photon or not detect a photon that's sent by Alice. But... <laughs> If she detects a photon, then she will, with, a, with a, a setting of her analyzer, then she can send an identical photon to Bob that has the same polarization that she detected. But the polarization that she's detected is not the polarization of the photon sent by Alice, except by accident. Because what she detects is the projection of Alice's photon onto her analyzer basis. So that's going to be wrong a quarter of the time. So Eve's, Eve's act of the, Eve cannot, without making a copy, a copy of the photon sent by Alice, she can't transmit faithfully the photon that Alice sent to Bob. And <clears throat> that will be revealed um, as that, that will, that Eve's, um, Eve's uh, interactions will give an, errors in the uh, reconciliation of the bases between the house and Bob. So it's, it's a failure in a statistical sense. It's kind of like, okay, you're going to cost, cost 10 coins and get all heads. That can happen. The likelihood that it does is small. So the, the, the eavesdropping protection has to do with the fact that in order to um, measure the signal sent by Alice, Eve, with statistical certainty, corrupts it. And so, uh, in, in you, you mentioned um, that QKD is commercialized already. Yes. Uh, do do we know? Uh, you know, I guess Cambridge Computing, I think, is one. Uh, if I my if I remember correctly, they have a, a QKD machine uh, on the market. Are they using BB eighty four, or is BB eighty four one of those? Okay, here's the general idea, but in practice, we have more sophisticated techniques beyond uh, BB eighty four. Maybe it's the base. So yeah, I, I can't speak to what's being implemented at this time by a given manufacturer. But certainly the, um, the long-range land-based implementations in China are based on BB-84. Okay. Uh, for the simple, so the entangled photon, uh, and we're not gonna, I, I'd say, if you, if you read the literature of, um, quantum cryptography, you'll find that BB-84 contains the essentials. The entangled source has an additional advantage of having a sort of a bell type inequality to validate the, um, it removes the ad hoc random number generation 
that's used in BB-84. So that's, that's a simplification of the process. But that simplification is done at an expense of uh, much uh, more, it's, it, it's, it's much more difficult technically that there are lower bit rates associated with producing entangled pairs than there are with producing uh, single photon sources. So the long range implementations of uh, QKD uh, to the best of my knowledge, BD84 is, is still ahead in competitiveness and where it um, uh, and, and that, 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 that has, just has to do with the um, greater, it has a higher attainable bit rates because of the greater, e, greater the more efficient uh, single photon production process versus entanglement production. But it's but both uh, but both of these um, well let me just say the only implementations of quantum key distribution of which I am aware use photons as the quantum transmission vehicle. Mm -hmm. Now you know you could use uh, you could use neutrons uh, or you could use neutrinos, uh, but for long-range communications, you can't use atoms or charged particles because they won't they won't travel any distance through through air or through materials. And so, um, uh, in that respect, you know, if QKD will almost certainly continue to be um, to use photons as the medium of communication. And in fact, a lot of a, a, a lot of quantum computing ideas, uh, you know, if you're talking about quantum computing in which you have to transfer quantum information, transfer qubit information across macroscopic distances, uh, you know, many such ideas utilize a um, transduction of quantum information from a material qubit to a photon. And so for the foreseeable future, uh, light is going to play a, a, a uh, considerable role in development of quantum information technology. So I think you know, things like the entangled photon sources uh, are, are going to, you know, move <coughs> Off the, um, they're they're under you know, continuing process of development, and as far as the you know, extending QKD over long range, the range of light is limited. Uh, I think you you mentioned this in one of the or brought this up in one of the previous lectures. If you shine a laser beam at a distant object, how far can the laser go before it's it's no longer uh, useful, and the answer is well, you know, quantum key distribution has been done across I think about 140 kilometers of air in the Canary Islands, and then there's this satellite to ground experiment in China, which is over I don't know what 600 kilometers or something. Well, the Charles pretty impressive. But that, but there's a, a problem of the divergence of the beam, which means that the bit rate, the transmitted information rate, falls off as the inverse square of the distance. Yeah, not to do a reverse on that, uh, you know, a replay on that. But what 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 my question was really driving at: Does a proton, a light proton, decohere? Does it? A light photon. Yeah. Uh, not not proton. Proton is the atomic Fo nucleus. Photon, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I'm not being pedagogic, but it's just. It's, yeah, it's correct me, please. I'm learning. So, uh, so the answer is that a photon. To think of that, you you should think first about what happens with an ordinary light beam, traveling through a medium like air, and the answer is, there's always some small scattering 
of the light by air. That is, if you're looking at distant objects on a clear day through a telescope, uh, you, you're, you're not able to resolve the finest detail in those distant objects from the telescope because there are fluctuations in the atmosphere that scatter light away. So uh, there's all in, in the atmosphere, there's always some irreducible level of noise. It's not high, but it limits the distance. So I would say that, um, you know, QK, I'll, I'll just say there's a bandwidth and attenuation rate. So I think the, in optical fiber, I think the, the attenuation in optical fiber of light and optical fiber is about 0.1 decibel per kilometer. And it's, it's below that in air, but it's maybe 0.01 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, uh, there's an intrinsic loss rate and, and it's, it's, ex, it's, it's exponential in, in a material medium. In fact, you know, the, the, at some point the, the loss rate is going as, you know, as a function of the distance d e, e to the minus something times d. That's why it's measured, measured in decibels. Okay. Thanks. So I know there are a lot of curious minds out there. I'm beginning to wonder if you guys are actually, you guys and gals are actually logged in. Here's your chance. Charles's billing rate goes up dramatically after this meeting here today. So I encourage you to ask away or make comments, please. I know I'm not the only one out there. Or am I? No pressure. Hey, Terrell, John. Hey, John, thank you. Um, so, uh, Charles, thank you so much. Uh, a couple of things as I was listening along. Um, I find that sometimes, you know, the simulations that people put together have been a great help as I, as I learn some of this stuff. And while you were talking, I found one from uh, St. Andrews that was specific to BB84 and Eve listening in. Um, so I, oh. I'll share that if you don't mind, maybe for everyone. That was part of the uh, question, and it relates to what you were just talking about with the um, air and satellite experiments and the attenuation using photons. And the uh, link I just sent talks about BB84 with spin half particles. So my mm -hmm. question is, do we, can we swap out the photon for, I think maybe you mentioned neutrons before, and does that get us any farther as far as the distance limitations that we see in the current experiments? Uh, so I haven't, um, I, I'm not familiar with the simulation that you mentioned. So certainly, <clears throat> um, the neutron is a spin half particle and, uh, it, 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 it can be polarized. I mean, I, I work in an environment where that sort of thing is done uh, routinely. The, the trouble for neutrons uh, that I see is that they're, they're difficult to produce conveniently. So, um, you know, there's, there are pulse neutron gener... Well, let's, let's say it this way. Research on using... Um, so... Optical scattering is used for materials analysis in, in thousands and thousands of laboratories in the world. Neutron beams are used for analyses in only a few places, typically those associated with nuclear reactors, like, for example, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, has a, uh, a neutron source, which is a nuclear reactor. Uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory also has one. Uh, there are other reactor-based sources of neutrons, and there are pulse neutron generators. But it's it's the it's the organizational overhead associated with maintaining a neutron source is very high. You need a radiation safety department. You typically need a license from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Got it. Uh, th th there's another spin one half particle that is truly marvelous 
and is even now neutrons also only live for 13 minutes in in the wild they decay spontaneously there's there's the new there's several varieties of neutrino and those are very weakly interacting with matter so they wouldn't have any of the problems of uh, scattering by the atmosphere but they are <laughs> The corollary is they're extremely difficult to detect. They're extremely difficult to produce controllably and extremely difficult uh, to detect. So I don't, I don't see, as a practical matter, I don't see uh, in, in terms of making, it'd be kind of cool to do a BB-84 protocol with neutrons in a reactor setting just as because you could, you know, but it's not going to uh, supplant, it's not going to pose a threat to commercial purveyors of optical QKD systems. Got it. More of a theoretical than a, than a practical? Uh, at, at this time, yeah. But certainly, I'm certainly not uh, suggesting that one not look at this as a research topic. So I'd be, I'd be happy to uh, have a look at that link. Did you put it on the chat? Yeah, it's there. Okay, thank I you. I screen shared it for a second. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, hi, Charles. It has been so great to listen to you and to be able to talk to you, actually. Uh, so uh, I've been listening to your sessions and uh, just uh, like very curious about like you know, what is the status of continuous variable QKDs right now? Is that a scope for future or uh, like? Uh, you know, the, uh, your your voice, uh, Sri, your voice is not coming through that clearly to me. Um, could if you could if you could type it in the chat, perhaps then Terrell could read the chat to me. Oh wait, maybe I can maybe I can look at it myself. Yeah, Let me see here. The audio is not clear. Okay. Is it, uh, did you, I said, thank you for a great presentation. I read several places that quantum computers will decrypt messages and may cause security risks. Is that your question? Uh, no. Um, uh, no. Continuous, uh, uh, like uh, discrete, we have continuous variable also, right? So what is the status of continuous variable QKDs like uh, uh, is the scope of continuous uh, variable QKD is also coming in like uh, is is that a future because uh, uh, as you have told BB84 could be a future and so many developments should come in that so like I have been reading a lot of papers talking about continuous variable QKDs as well mm. so just curious about like what is the status on that yeah I don't to be honest I don't know that much about the continuous variable QKD uh, I, I think it's, it's, I believe it's still pretty much in the, uh, a research topic. I'd have to, you know, just mention that the BB-84 protocol was first devised as a theory. It was a theory paper by Bennett and Broussard in 1984. And somewhat remarkably for a theorist, it was Bennett himself with help from Broussard who actually produced the first experimental implementation of QKD on a laboratory benchtop at the IBM TJ Watson Research Laboratories in Armagh, New York, yeah, in about 1992. So um, experimental QKD has been under development now for close to, well, for more than a quarter century. So actually I was, I was involved in free space, personally involved in free space QKD experiments uh, over kilometer style distances through the open air outside a laboratory environment and in daylight um, 15 years ago. So there's been a, you know, there's a, the, the development of the commercial systems has taken some time and uh, its progress is, is, it's really riding on the backs, the back of optical 
technology. So for example, without the development, you know, the optical telecommunications infrastructure of the world has developed in unbelievably during the past quarter century, right? Compare like those of you who can remember cellular telephony in 1995 to what we have today. So all the, um, the laser development that was necessary for the development of the telecommunications infrastructure had a huge spin-off to um, uh, optical QKD. And so I think from the standpoint of what's going to come up as a research topic, as a very interesting research topic, I'd say continuous variables uh, are probably, you know, the most interesting thing. But as a perspective, um, as a perspective civilization changing uh, vehicle, okay, for sure, telecommunications has been transformative. I don't think anyone can argue against that. Whether the transformations are all for good or all for ill, or let's say the balance between ill and good can be debated. But, uh, you know, I think you, when you look at quantum technology of any type, I think it's most appropriate to think of it as a, as a piece of a, the larger framework. So it's kind of like, why is quantum computing important anyway? Okay, intellectually, of course, it's important. It's fun, very fundamentally important. But why are people willing to, to spend lots of money and effort on it? It's because of the, the societal ramifications that it might provide, which potentially could be very large. So in that sense, I think, you know, quantum technology is something to be viewed in... Uh, what's the word, a, a, a holistic way as part of the, you know, the larger sphere of uh, development technology with all its, you know, the social and ethical implications are all, you know, there's, there are many factors at play and uh, quantum is not a magic bullet for anything that I'm aware of. And it's, uh, it's utility to society as a, a, a practical technology is still, you know, is still unproven. But, you know, you might say the utility of society of nuclear reactions was unproven in 1932. You know, within first year the neutron was discovered, it didn't seem to have any important implications and then then all of a sudden it changed the world so. um, yeah Sarita was asking a question and that's what you saw in the chat there uh, uh -huh. I read uh, several places that quantum computers will decrypt messages and may cause security risks yeah so that's a um, uh, that was that was you know the kind of the message at the, uh, the conclusion of my first lecture that uh, the quantum computers have the theoretical power to break, uh, to, to make it practical to break public key infrastructure. And furthermore, so the way public key infrastructure has evolved, the data encryption standards have evolved in time because as computers you know, you have like, you know, 128-bit RSA key. Oh, uh, that's, you know, that's pretty good. Um, or when it was, when it was first promulgated as, a, as an encryption standard, it was satisfactory because it, it took a lot of computer cycles to break it. But as computers got bigger and faster, eventually the length of the RS key had to be increased over time. And so, you know, <clears throat> it still works pretty good, except for a, attacks by 
you know, large coordinated entities. Uh, and with the, the, the possible advent of, if, if Shor's algorithm can be implemented on a, uh, a in, in a practical way, then it would completely change the use of public key infrastructure. We'd have to abandon the RSA approach. Well, I mean, let's say, in the what it means is, in the long term, the cryptographer can no longer beat, can no longer always beat the crypt analyst. So actually, there's a lot of work going on right now in identifying what's called post-quantum cryptography methods. In fact, that my employer NIST is a is serving as the national coordinator of such an effort to identify encryption strategies that are not susceptible to quantum computer attack. So I guess the one thing to say is it's hard to prove things are impossible. For example, it hasn't been proven yet that it's classically hard to factor a prime number. It's just there's a lot of evidence for that. It's uh, most of the alternatives to the post-quantum alternatives for encryption what can be said for them is no one has shown that quantum computers can break them. That doesn't mean they can't be broken by quantum computers, but no one knows how to do it now. So I'd say the idea of the quantum computer as something that has universal power to uh, crack codes of whatever type it is, not, is not based on any evidence. It's, it's very useful for um, uh, attacking algorithms that are based on what's called the discrete logarithm problem. May have other, may have other applications as well, but uh, I, I'm not aware. But again, I think I said that's in my first lecture. The only reason that anyone is even listening to this talk is because of this threat to public key, key yeah. infrastructure due to a quantum computer. Uh, otherwise, you know, quantum computer would be, it would be like people studying time machines or something. Yeah, you can have a really good uh, after dinner discussion about time machines, but it's not like anyone's investing a lot of money in that. Let me add a plug here. I'm getting a um, an event put together, and I'm just checking real quick to see if I've actually announced it. But uh, I've got a, a, a PhD student uh, who will give us a presentation. Oh, there it is on September 24th, and she she is uh, going to walk through the NIST post quantum, you know, those algorithms, those techniques that are in the final. In the third oh, that's round, great. that's great. And, and she's going to go walk through. She's, I've seen her talk, her talk before, and she'll walk through the various techniques. Not all the gory detail, but you know the way it's dealing with lat. The, the number one solution right now, I think, involves lattices, mm -hmm. and and you know how that might work, etc. So it's uh, September twenty fourth for you, post quantum cryptography people. I mean, she does a really good job of just you know giving you what you need to know. To, to get some sort of sense of what those primary candidates look like, their techniques and why why they would be different and not be breakable with a quantum computer. So, Who, who is this person, Carol? Uh, let me see, I forget her name. Uh, Ma, uh, Mahima Mary is her name. She's a PhD student. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a nice high level, but enough to get you to understand, you know, what what the various techniques are, you know, the lattice and the, yeah. there are a couple of other techniques. Uh, yeah, so so I would suggest, Sarita, that, that that's a talk that would address a, a, the questions that you've just brought up in a, yeah. you know, a very focused way. Yeah, and it's not so deep that, you know, we get lost in the sauce. She, she does a really good job. Um, but yeah, others, should I call names out? 
of course, we are pushing the envelope here. Uh, <laughs> it's, time, it's, time it's time for my tea, and yeah. yeah, I think I think we're actually a little bit overdue. So I'm yeah, gonna I'm thank gonna you. Th thank everybody for uh, showing up, and uh, hope that you came away with something uh, something worth. Oh, I just wanted to, the last thing again. I stopped sharing my screen. If well, you can put it back up. Anything, anything. Uh, uh, if you, if you want to pursue anything I've said in a meaningful way, I really uh, recommend studying the quantum random number generator simply because it's, it's got the real quantum elements, the essence of quantum mechanics into it. It's an important and practical device and you can, you can learn, I think most technical people can learn enough about it to start thinking about how something like that can be used in a fruitful way. It would give, give you, if you're looking for like, like an icon to help you understand quantum technology, that's a pretty good one. Okay, that's my last word on the subject. I put a number of papers in the chat there for people to look, but it's just basically a Google search and there's quite a few documents you can work through on that. But Charles, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's been three days, uh, uh, probably more than you bargained for when I first reached out to you, but I'm glad you've taken us down this path. I, you know, this quantum stuff, it's not something you can really get in an hour, no matter how small the topic or how large the topic is. So three days, I think, is, is really good to get us thinking about it and get us kick started. Um, I wish there was something I could do to re repay you, reward you for this effort. Um, but uh, COVID, it's, well, it's I, I can give you a t-shirt. That's a useful opportunity for me to, you know, try try refining my arguments, test them out on another audience. So I appreciate, okay. appreciate the ability to do this. Anytime you need some guinea pigs for testing ideas out or delivery mechanisms, just give me a buzz. More than happy to host you. All right. Thank you very Take much. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Everybody else, have a good day, and uh, we'll see you next time. And Charles, come by and visit sometime, anytime. Will do. All right. Bye-bye.